1966, two years before his assassination, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was invited to give the Ware Lecture for the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly. Now that was just five years after the merger of two Protestant Christian faiths, Unitarianism and Universalism, into a more expansive and inclusive denomination. Now Dr. King had an affinity for UUs. He and his wife Coretta had attended Unitarian churches for many years before the merger of the Unitarians and Universalists. Coretta said in an interview once that they would have liked to join the Unitarian Church, but quote, they could never build a mass movement of black people if they were Unitarian. And of course, she was correct, and what a shame that is. But nonetheless, a few years later, Dr. King began his Ware Lecture to the UUA with the words, there are these wonderful moments in life when you speak before a group that is so near and dear to you that you don't feel like you have to engage in the art of persuasion. You don't feel you are in the midst of strangers. You know that you are with friends. I can assure you I feel that way tonight. Dr. King went on to express his gratitude for UUs he'd worked with personally in the racial justice movement, including UU minister Reverend James Reeb, who died at the age of 38, having been beaten severely by four white men while defending civil rights in Selma with Dr. King one year before. I don't think many people realize this bright moment in UU history. Well, actually, that was a bad segue. <laughs> Not Dr. Reverend Reeb's death, but this bright moment and how that where Dr. King acknowledged Unitarian Universalism and also how close we, were, we came to being able to claim him and Coretta as our own. Can you imagine the trajectory that would have been set for our denomination had they joined the Unitarian and Universalist Church? Unitarian Universalism would probably now be in the consciousness of most Americans. But alas, white supremacy culture comes at a cost to all people. While we suffered and continue to suffer the effects of our embedded white supremacy, on the flip side, we UUs have also been known to throw our hats in the ring even when it comes with significant risk. One thing we have going for us as a religion committed to a progressive theology is our commitment to always learning more and doing better, to continuing to dismantle white supremacy and prejudices within ourselves. Our covenants require us to stay awake, to resist the temptation to do as Dr. King said, sleep through the revolution. We endeavor not to get stuck in old ways of thinking and being, but to keep moving forward and growing our souls. But that doesn't mean that sometimes we don't fall asleep at the wheel. Today I wanted to share with you Dr. King's call specifically to Unitarian Universalists not to sleep through the revolution. All the quotes of Dr. King that I used today and that Richard shared with us were spoken directly to UUs in his 1966 address. He said, one of the great misfortunes of history is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in a great period of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the situation demands. There's nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. He called us to consider how the progress and change we are experiencing during a cultural revolution informs our day-to-day -day life and our visions and our actions, and this is still guidance and wisdom that we can heed today. As Dr. King pointed out, churches play a unique role in our society, and while many of us here have a disdain for the role that churches have played in our society. We are called as a religious community to use the power and authority of the structure that we have adopted to be a force for change and for the good. Dr. King believed that all churches, but the UU Church in particular, are well positioned to help us usher in a new age of freedom and justice for people of color and poor people. He said to the UUs that Quote, when the church is true to its nature, it stands as a moral guardian of the community and of society. 
how often we forget to claim our power and our responsibility to act as moral guardians of society. We might not feel like it over here in our humble little church building in the suburbs, that we stand as moral guardians, but that progress pride flag, our Black Lives Matter sign, and our sign that reads out a religious home for the liberal spirit. Those are powerful communications of our moral guardianship and our values. And if we don't claim moral authority, pop culture will gladly take over for us. Because while pop culture can be progressive, it also can be selfish and individualistic. And ultimately, pop culture is driven by money. Our church exists outside the for-profit industry that has taken over our culture and is motivated by righteousness and by a desire to do right for the sake of doing right. And that is what sets this place apart. This is where our church is particularly important. We exist because we believe in promoting our values in our lives and in the wider world. Dr. King reminds us how important that is and how we need each other to do this work. We believe that love of all people trumps hate. We believe in inclusion and freedom to make our health care decisions and justice for all. <clears throat> When people band together, it amplifies our voices exponentially. So whenever we take to the street to protest or we show up in the public square, I put this clergy collar on because it carries moral authority. And in our mainstream culture, if you say, I go to a church where we love queer folks, we support a woman's right to choose, well then by identifying as a UU, you are claiming moral authority. And that's really important right now more than ever. Our country and the human race right now is engaged in a battle between compassion and mercy and justice and generosity and selfishness and fear and hate. We are called to identify with others who share our values and amplify our collective voices by any means necessary. Claiming the words church and religion and reverend might help. It can help. Our church is the latest incarnation of a long tradition of people using reason and experience to question the dominant paradigm and to speak up for what we know is right and just. Michael Servetus is one of our religious ancestors, a Unitarian who was burned at the stake by John Calvin in 1553 for his denial of the Holy Trinity. He gave his life so that freedom of conscience could become a civil right in modern society. Now that's just one story from centuries of Unitarian and Universalist history where people were unwilling to go along with ideas that didn't make sense to them and they didn't accept that, that they were being given objective truth. We come from a long line of questioners who shared our core values. Centuries of clergy and congregations engaged in a battle to promote reason and inclusion and liberty. So don't let the word church turn you off because then the bad guys win. Just because the biggest, shiniest churches may be propagating bad theology doesn't mean they get to own the definition of church or they get to dictate morality in our society. Dr. King reminds us that our church has a role to play in social change. And he knew his stuff. Not only did he have a bachelor's in sociology, but he had a doctorate in systemic, systematic theology. So today there are many churches that are fighting social change by resisting and warring against diversity and inclusion against African American studies and the full education of our children. This is what Dr. King was talking about when he warned us against, quote, failing to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the new situation demands. If we aren't going to sleep through the revolution, then we have to adapt because we have a battle to fight, a battle against ignorance and white supremacy and false claims to moral authority. 
Dr. King reminds us that this road we are taking is one that other people look to, one that has influence and power in our society. Because we you use, we might wear jeans to church, but that doesn't mean we're not doing something important here. And what Dr. King was so good at doing was reminding us of the big picture. We have faith that what we do matters and that we change the world with all, this, all the little things that we do and say and how we identify ourselves in the world. Dr. King called us to, quote, reaffirm over and over the essential immorality of racial segregation. In today's language, his call to you use may translate into centering the eighth principle in everything we do. He said, we must make it clear that segregation, whether it's in public schools, in housing, in recreation facilities, or the church itself, is morally wrong. The church must take a stand through religious education and other channels to direct the popular mind at this point. Now the segregation he was referring to in 1966 was literally redlining who could live where. Laws against people of color having equal access to education and jobs and swimming pools and drinking fountains, being able to choose who they wanted to marry. But don't think for a minute that while we have changed our laws for the better, that people of color today have equal access and rights and privileges that white people enjoy. He said, it may be true that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. The law cannot make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. And so while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men. So it is necessary for the church to support strong, meaningful civil rights legislation. Now, here at Columbine, we have it really easy because we are pledging members of Together Colorado. And we are partnered and guided by a multicultural group of brilliant clergy and lay people who are focusing resources on passing humane and just legislation for the poor and marginalized in our local community. Together Colorado works to create e easy ways for member churches to amplify our voices and be heard by lawmakers. We use our Facebook pages and our website and we're able to be and here at Columbine, this is new, we're able to be stewards and collectors of money and other resources to help move out into the community towards justice. So it's not just me with my collar on, but all of you with the relationships and trust that you build with each other and the ways you champion each other. We are stronger together than as individuals. Our power and our voice together are amplified exponentially. Coming together to feed our souls and evolve our spirits here, learning to be righteous and just people is how we live into our vision of liberating love. During January, we will focus on asking ourselves, what does liberating love mean? And how do we manifest it? Because the words liberating love are energizing. They are bold words that cast out fear and bring people of different viewpoints together. Liberating love is the core of nonviolent revolution. It's tolerant, patient, wise, and grounded. It helps us to stay nimble and responsive to other people, and it helps us to stay awake for the revolution. On this weekend of celebration for the work and wisdom of Dr. King, we are invited to manifest our vision of liberating love. What a gift it is to have this place. This afternoon, Liskin and I are going to show our neighbors from the LDS church across the street around our building. And they're excited to show us some new artwork that they have and talk about how their youth and our youth might do service work together. This is an opportunity for liberating love, for finding our shared values that we hold with our neighbors and building on the power of building bridges. And we get to show them our new Polly Murray portrait. <laughs> that picture and what it stands for is 
a symbol of our liberating love and how we let it shine in the world. And these are the things we do that help usher in the revolution. What a gift it is to live this grand experiment of what it means to center ourselves in liberating love. Blessed be and may it be so.